Um, okay, so I wanted to start with a story this morning. I used to live in Phoenix. And as you can imagine, in Phoenix, it's really hot, right? Like, we at least know that much about Phoenix. Um, and I remember that uh, there was a time, I think it was in July, I was taking a class on the ASU campus, the college campus that was there. And in order to get from the parking lot to the place my class was, you had to walk past all the soccer fields. And so it was a night class. And so once night goes down, like once the sun goes down, everyone in Phoenix comes out. You hide during the day and you come out out at night and in the early morning. So it was nighttime, and as a result, like all of the college students are out on the soccer field playing games, pickup games. Some of them were uh, still in practice and stuff like that. They're all playing, and it's hot, and everybody's sweating. Like, it's bad, right? And, and there's a water cooler because in Phoenix, if you don't have water, you die. Like, literally, people die every year because they just don't have water. And so there's always water provided wherever you go. You bring your water bottle. Your life revolves around having water. And so as I'm walking, what I see happen is that there is this guy that has been running the field playing soccer. He's a sweaty mess. He's got his shirt off like he's just drenched, right? And he's running over to the water cooler in order to get some water. But as he runs over, what happens is, is he, instead of grabbing some water to put in his body, all of the remaining water that was in his body comes out of his body. And he winds up throwing up right next to the water cooler, which does not have a lid on it. And some of, like I just noticed, some of the water, some of his vomit, like bounces off of the ground back into the water cooler. Now, here's the question. It's July in Phoenix. You've been running around. You're thirsty. Do you drink the water or not? I mean, it's just a little bit of vomit that went in to that water cooler. So like, do you drink to drink or not to drink? Now, what happened was, is, is very quickly, there was a whole bunch of guys that came around the water cooler, and this is the very debate that they're having. Do we drink this or do we not drink this? What do we do? How contaminated is too contaminated to be, to have this water in our body. I don't know, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> now in our series that we're talking about, we're in the book of Acts and we're calling it the believers because what the author of the book of Acts, Luke, is doing is he's basically talking about the next 30 years after Jesus has died and come back from the dead. What happens after Jesus' resurrection with all of the believers? What happens from that space on? At the very beginning, the believers were really all members of the same sect. They were all Jewish boys, homegrown in Judea, or probably even more in Galilee. In Galilee. They all spoke the same language, Aramaic. They all held the same worldview. They had the same ethnicity. They held the same culture. They practiced holidays in the same ways. But what Jesus tells them after his resurrection and actually through his whole ministry is that, listen, one day this is all going to change. One day my kingdom will not just rest in the hands of some Jewish boys, but it will be a worldwide thing, a worldwide multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multiracial, worldwide movement. And that's only going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes in power but the kingdom is going to grow. And so what Luke is documenting in the book of Acts is actually how that happens, how over 30 years, just 30 years with no internet and no easy global travel and no Google Translate, the good news that heaven has come to earth, that a new kingdom rules and reigns, begins to cross every boundary that existed. And Luke tells us in Acts 1, verse 8, that Jesus said it would happen like this. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the list of places that Luke lists in Acts is actually really important. Jerusalem was the city that this whole thing, like, that's the city that Jesus died in. That's the capital city. That's where the temple is, or the Jewish capital city. That's where the temple is. That's where, like, all of Jesus, as much of Jesus' ministry happened, his death, his resurrection. That's where the followers, the believers are right now in Jerusalem. And what they have seen is that, that it's a Roman-occupied area, but mostly Jewish. 
And what has happened is that the gospel has taken firm roots in that place. But then beyond that is this area called Samaria. That's like the next town over. The people that, oh, um, sorry, wait. So first it's Jerusalem. That's the place where the apostles have been hanging out. And then bigger than that, sort of like the providence or the state that Jerusalem is in is Judea. That's that whole area surrounding, and it's pretty much like Jerusalem. It's still Roman-occupied, but mostly it's filled with Jewish people, so similar people. The next area over, though, is Samaria. The people there came from the nation of Israel, but for various reasons, there was, they, they were seen as like the tainted ones. They had a little bit of vomit in the water. Okay, And there was sort of this mutual hostility between the Jewish people and the Samaritans for lots and lots of different reasons. And then Jesus says the ends of the earth, and the ends of the earth are, well, everything else, right? Now, so far, their witness about Jesus has happened in Jerusalem, and it's been pretty successful. There's lots of people who have chosen to believe the apostles and follow Jesus. They've baptized lots of people. Now, they came up against many, many different obstacles. There were language barriers, but the Holy Spirit came in and let them speak a lot of languages. There were power struggles, but God took care of that by giving them confidence. They even were put in jail, but God took care of that by sending angels to unlock the jail. They had beatings, but God took care of that by emboldening them and giving them joy as a result of these lashings. But so far, everything stayed pretty local. However, as we enter Acts chapters 6, 7, and 8, we see how the believers are actually propelled into the next city. See, there was this guy named Stephen along with this guy named Philip and five others who were chosen to take care of the inner workings of the congregation. That's what we talked about last week. And we're told that Stephen was filled with the spirit, that he performed many signs and wonders. He proclaimed, he preached the gospel, he preached the good news, but he also demonstrated. So if he's preaching, hey, listen, a kingdom of justice and love and compassion and mercy have come to earth and wholeness have come to earth, then he demonstrates it by like doing acts of compassion and justice and love and mercy, some of them supernatural. And there was a group of religious leaders who really didn't like what Stephen was doing, and they stirred up some lies about what he was doing and what he was saying. Now, if you read in Acts chapter 6, you'll notice that this whole uh, event of of Stephen's um, accusation and his trial and even his death is very similar to what Luke tells us about how Jesus' trial and accusers and death happened. And when... Stephen is asked, hey, these lies that these people have brought up against you, are they true? Stephen gives this beautiful response in chapter 7, where basically he says to all of the Jewish religious leaders, he says, listen, your great, great granddaddy, he rejected those who came to tell them the truth. And then your great granddaddy, he rejected those who came to tell them the truth. And then your granddaddy, He also rejected those who came to tell them the truth. And your daddy, he also rejected the truth. And what you're doing right now is rejecting the truth. Okay, so the religious leaders, they didn't like this. They thought this was really terrible. So they got all sorts of mad at Stephen, picked up some rocks, and they stoned him. They killed him. And it's this terrible story. Stephen actually becomes the first of many, many believers who were martyred for the proclamation and the demonstration of their faith. And Stephen's death marked the beginning of this great persecution. Actually, at the end of chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 8, we're introduced to this guy named Saul. That while Stephen was being stoned, he's the one who held the coats. Now think about this at a party. Like, who holds the coats? the host of the party, right? So Stephen's getting stoned and Saul's like, yes, give me your coat. I'll hold this while you go stone that guy. And we're introduced to this guy named Saul. Now, we're gonna talk more about Saul next time, but he really is the leader of this huge persecution. And as a result, the church in Jerusalem says, we can't stick around here. We gotta get out of town. We gotta get out of here. 
And so followers of Jesus then go into all the different areas surrounding Jerusalem and to all of Judea and even into Samaria to begin to live the life that they live as believers in these different parts. Now, I don't believe that God caused this persecution to happen. However, I do believe that God bends all things, even evil things, for his good and his purposes. So as people went out into Judea and to Samaria, they began to spread the good news of Jesus and the kingdom to all of those places, fulfilling exactly what Jesus said would happen at the beginning of Acts. Now, one such person that was sent into these places was this guy named Philip. Um, Philip actually winds up in Samaria, which is, again, that next circle over, so Jerusalem, Judea, and then Samaria. And he starts to proclaim and demonstrating that the kingdom of God has come, which is awesome. And then Peter and John, the big guns who are the apostles who walked with Jesus, show up and they're like, we'll continue this. We'll take all the credit. That's what they always do. But Philip was the one who was there first. And then... The kingdom of God is about to move to the next circle, to the ends of the earth. Now, Philip is told while he's in Samaria by an angel of the Lord to go south, to basically go so far south that he goes past Jerusalem and travels on a road out of Jerusalem and then west to Gaza. It's sort of towards the Mediterranean Sea. And while he's on his way, he meets this Ethiopian eunuch, who happened to be a very important official that was in charge of all of the queen's treasury, uh, the queen of the Ethiopian's treasury. So he had all the money, took care of it for the queen. Now, I used to work with students, middle schoolers and high schoolers, and they, whenever I taught about this story, they'd always ask me the same question. How did they know that he was a eunuch? And for a long time, I was like, ah. I'm stumped. I don't know. But here's how they knew. Here's how they knew that he was a eunuch. Now, I'm not totally sure. Like, maybe it came up in in conversation. But I think more likely what happened was that Philip would have known that he was an Ethiopian just by his dark skin. In fact, at that time, they believed Ethiopians were anybody who lived south of Egypt. You were Egyptian or you were Ethiopian. There was no distinction beyond that. It was, he was an Ethiopian. He had dark skin. That must have been time. And... I think that he would have known right away that he was an official based on the way that he was traveling, probably some insignia, or probably the way that his caravan walked with him. And because of that, he concluded he was a eunuch because eunuchs would have been, it would have been implied that he was a eunuch because the Ethiopian monarchy was led by a lady, a queen. And at that time, when a queen would rule, all of the men who were in their service were either either chose to be castrated or were forcibly castrated. That was just a part of the job description. That's just what they did. And so even though we don't really know how Philip knew, we can guess that that is probably what was going on here. And even though Luke gives us three descriptors about this eunuch, that he's Ethiopian, that he's an official and that he's a eunuch. Luke continues to describe this man throughout the whole story as the eunuch, right? So for us, he, it's, 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 it's important that he's Ethiopian. It's important that he's an official. But more than anything, for some reason, it's really important that we know that he is a eunuch. And it begs the question, why does the state of his genitalia matter so much in this story? Why? And in order for us to understand this, we actually have to go way, 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 way back to when the Jewish people were just beginning to be shaped as a nation. See, God desired to be in a covenant relationship with the Hebrew people. And part of that was um, making sure that everything was holy and that those who participated in worshiping God were whole. If you were going to be in the presence of God, you needed to be whole and you needed to be holy. And the presence of God was understood as the temple or the tabernacle and then later the temple. 
And so they knew that this was really, really important to God. So Moses, their earthly leader at the time, who was writing all of the commands of God down, writing down much of the Torah, began to pen down the things that were holy and the things that could be in God's presence and the things that were not whole and the things that could not be in God's presence, that could not be a part of the worshiping community. And in some ways, it was like he was basically listing the things that would have made God's water cooler tainted with vomit. And so in order to keep it fresh and clean and good, there were things that they wrote down that were like, these things can't be in God's presence. And so actually, you can find that list in Deuteronomy 23. There's a list of people. He lists the Amorites and the Edenites and the Egyptians. Uh, The reason they were excluded was because they hadn't been good neighbors to the Hebrews. And so they were like, they're out. They can't be a part of this. They've been hostile to us and therefore God. Also listed that no children of illegitimate birth for 10 generations could be in the presence of God. There were lots of other listed, but the one that's most important for our purposes right now is, uh, is the first thing that's listed as eunuchs. Eunuchs are not allowed to be in the presence of God. They're not allowed to be in the worshiping community. They're not allowed to be in the tabernacle, and therefore they're not allowed to be in the temple later on. This is the foundations of their faith. Now, years and years and years go by, and the nation of Israel, the the Hebrew people had become this great nation of Israel. They became a kingdom. But as the kings ruled, they drifted further and further and further from what God desired this nation to be. And the kingdom of Israel actually falls, and it's conquered by another nation. And most of the people in Israel are dragged off into exile. And the temple and the city are burned, and they lie in ruins left in ashes. And there's only a small remnant of people that remain in Jerusalem. However, during that time, there was one guy in Jerusalem. His name is Isaiah. And he was a prophet. He, he sought the face of God. He listened to the Spirit. He longed to know what God was doing in this space. And so God used him and began to give him visions and an understanding of what the future rebuilt kingdom of God would one day look like. And Isaiah began to write poems about what this kingdom of God would one day look like, of, of what it would look like when heaven would come to earth. And in Isaiah chapter 56, Isaiah pens that he sort of writes down this, this, um, what he imagines would this, this new worshiping community would actually be like. And what he says is that there would be both foreigner and eunuch would no longer be excluded from God's presence or his house. It, it says this in Isaiah 56, it says, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memory and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Now this, what Isaiah wrote, would have been totally and completely radical. Like, this was radical inclusion. And there would have been a ton of people that would have come to him and said, yeah, but, like, you know those yeah, but people? There would have been a lot of those standing in Isaiah's face. They would have said, I mean, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the yeah, but people, they're the people that say, yeah, that's a good idea, but here's all the reasons why that can't happen. Uh, Jesus had the yeah, but people too. Like Jesus said, love your enemies. And the Jewish leaders would come back and say, yeah, but the Old Testament says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is the Old Testament and Jesus competing with each other. But Jesus wins every time because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, Isaiah doesn't care when he writes this down. He doesn't care that it's contrary to what the Torah says because he's talking about a future time that will one day come when everyone gets to be included in the kingdom of God. 
And even though Isaiah has this vision, it doesn't actually happen. In fact, years later, when the, um, the nation of Israel is actually allowed to go back to Jerusalem and they're allowed to rebuild the temple and they're allowed to rebuild the city, you would think that they would have had this experience of outcast and inclusion and sort of learned their lesson from being exiled and that they would have like um, started to have empathy for the foreigner and the marginalized. But but instead, what happened is it actually fostered this worldview of us versus them. It sort of continued and left them with this feeling that they needed to hoard and protect their own power. So they excluded the poor Samaritans and the foreigners and the sick. And they thought the best way to protect their nation and their customs and to keep themselves holy and in the presence of God was to keep everyone else out. So they sort of doubled down. They made it even more exclusionary. And in fact, around the time when Jesus was born, there was actually an extra wall that was built in the temple to keep those who, were whole, who weren't holy or weren't enough, like non-Jews and foreigners and eunuchs and so many others, out of entering the temple or even seeing what was happening in the temple. Now, on this wall, this huge wall that sort of marked off this whole your outsiders also had inscriptions around the whole thing. And it said, no foreigner is to go beyond the barrier of this temple. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame and death to follow. Dun, dun, dun. They wanted everyone out. And that is the cultural context of Jerusalem at this time when Philip sees this eunuch. And so Luke tells us that this eunuch had actually gone to Jerusalem. This is like a thousand mile journey for this eunuch to go through. And he had gone there to go to the temple in order to behold the Hebrew God. Now, it might seem strange in our whole culture, like, why would, like, an Ethiopian travel all this way to, to find out and explore about a God who isn't his? Like why, like, why would you do that? And the reality is, is that it wasn't so abnormal to add additional gods um, in order to sort of discover and figure out, like, what kind of more power can I possess? If I worship this God, too, how, how might I benefit myself? So probably what the eunuch was doing was traveling in order to find more gods to bring back to, his, to, to Ethiopia and to the queen. But what the eunuch probably didn't expect was to get to the temple and to try to experience this great God only to arrive at this wall that says, you're not allowed in, go home. And so the spirit tells Philip to draw close and he hears this eunuch reading from none other than the prophet Isaiah. Now, he's not reading the part about the dream in the, in the in inclusive community, um, but, but he is reading Isaiah, the very guy that had the vision when God's kingdom comes that the eunuchs could be in the presence of God. And the eunuch doesn't know anything about it. It's all new to him. And so what we're told is that then... Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. He goes, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asks. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, Luke tells us that in this passage the eunuch is reading is actually from Isaiah 53. It's a passage that's called the Suffering Servant Passage. It points out that one day a Messiah will come. One day someone will come. And this person will come and suffer and be excluded and be murdered so that all people might be able to enter into the presence of God. And Philip begins to explain that Jesus was the one who was exposed to all the violence, all the brokenness, and death that was perpetuated by unjust systems. And instead of Jesus then committing more violence to try to fix it or get out of it, Jesus actually absorbs all the violence unto himself, allowing himself to be killed. And he offers in its place love and forgiveness and peace. And now because God is stronger than the grave and he lives outside of death, Jesus comes back to life. 
And since Jesus has now broken all of those systematic, unjust systems, Jesus makes a way into the presence of God and offers those who trust in him life. Now, I imagine that the message that Philip was speaking cut quickly to the eunuch's heart. Because while they're having this conversation, the eunuch sees some water along the side of the road and asks Philip, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? Now, this question wasn't rhetorical, and it it wasn't like just a cute, like, hey, why don't we do this now? The question was actually in earnest. At the heart of it, the eunuch is asking, who is this good news really for? Who is really allowed to be in the presence of God? Who is really permitted into this life that's represented by baptism? What are the actual boundaries of who is in and who is out? So the eunuch is testing the boundaries of what Philip is actually saying. If Jesus really did absorb all of the brokenness that we, so that we can enter the presence of God, does that really mean that I, a eunuch, who just got barred from the temple, can actually enter the presence of God. What barriers stand in my way? I mean, remember this. He had traveled a thousand miles to get to Jerusalem, and the temple says, you're excluded. So his question is ultimately, what is the fine print on this this inclusionary, this radical inclusiveness of the kingdom of God? What's the fine print? And Philip says, nothing, nothing, nothing. Jesus made a way for all people, foreigner, broken, sexually disfigured, messy, hurt, lost, sick, sinful, cast aside, marginalized, oppressed, to enter the kingdom. And what's so amazing is that Philip is so empowered and so emboldened by the Holy Spirit that he doesn't run back to Peter or John and double check, hey, we're serious, like nothing means nothing, right? Like we really mean nothing. He's led by the Holy Spirit and he's confident in this moment and he baptizes the eunuch into the kingdom of God. And we begin to see this beautiful picture of Acts 1.8 to the ends of the earth, take shape. Now, the early church was sort of dismantling all of these systematic institutional exclusion that existed one by one, language, ethnicity, race, sexuality, all of it. They just broke it all down. Everyone was included in this thing. But as the church has continued, generation, century after century, we often have become the chief propagators of the yeah, but crowd. We sort of mix the Torah and the teachings of Jesus, the old covenant that was done away with and the new covenant that Jesus established. And instead of tearing down walls and barriers that stood in opposition to resurrection life, we resurrected walls and rules and regulations that excluded people from life. It was like we were sort of in the business of trying to protect God's water cooler from getting any vomit in it instead of realizing that because of the radical and awesome power and work of Jesus, everyone's been transformed. Everyone's been made whole. And you no longer can contaminate the presence of God because Jesus has transformed us all in the presence of God. That everyone has a right to draw close to God. Everyone is accepted. Everyone belongs. Everyone is a part of this kingdom. And so there's no more walls of hostility that divide those who are in and those who are out. Paul actually describes it this way in the book of Ephesians. Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, 
by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. What Paul is saying is that because of Jesus, we're a new human family and we're all welcome. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't talk the same, but we are united. And your entry card is that you confess that you're sinful, that you're a messed up person, that's screwed up, that's prideful, that lives in a culture where you think you're better than everyone else that you have wreaked havoc in this world, but then you say, the Son of God loves me, and he's given his life for me, and he's invited me to his, this resurrected life that includes every tribe, every language, every ethnicity, every gender, every color, every ability is welcome. But tearing down these walls of hostility between God and us as individuals, is only the beginning. Jesus also came to tear down walls that were created by the cultural systems and institutions that exist around us. See, Paul goes on to say in that very same book of Ephesians, he said, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the powers and rulers in the heavenly realm. And this is what he's, he means. What he's saying is that when unity and radical inclusion is experienced inside the church, it's a direct challenge to the power of the cultural systems and institutions that divide, like racism and sexism and nationalism, all the isms. See, the powers, they don't get to define what happens here, not in this family and not in this kingdom. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We are one in Christ. Whatever the divides and the breakdowns and the walls are, they don't get a say in the kingdom of God. This is his house and his love and grace has built this house by the work of Jesus. And in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. See, in Jesus and in our faith in him, only we get to approach God. We all get invited in. So when Philip is asked what stands in the way, he answers nothing. And then what we're told is that he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptizes him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip knows this is going to be a hot mess. Philip knows that the eunuch doesn't have everything theologically worked out. He knows that his life is still very messy politically and spiritually and relationally and theologically and all the alis. And yet Philip says, Come, be baptized, walk into this. And the eunuch goes away rejoicing. The eunuch is baptized into the unified body of believers. It's this beautiful vision of the kingdom of God going to the ends of the earth. See, the vision that Isaiah had longed for that wasn't realized back then because Isaiah was so ahead of his time. It isn't until Jesus uh, comes that it's realized and, and there's the ability to live in the presence of God because it's no longer determined by human constructs, but by faith in Jesus. I heard this thing this week when I was doing some reading. It said, hierarchies and strategies of exclusion belong to the old world that died with Christ. The new world of the risen Christ, revolutionary inclusion and equality reign. Ethnic hierarchies, economic hierarchies, gender hierarchies are done away with. Here's the deal. Following Jesus is just as much about dying as it is about living. See, Jesus tells us that if we want to follow him into life, we must first die. And on my journey of following Jesus, I'm going to be real honest. 
There's a lot of belief systems and a lot of structural systems and a lot of exclusionary thinking that has had to die along the way in my journey with Jesus. There are things that I've had to unlearn and there's things that I'm relearning along the way, just like the early church did. And there are things that we as a congregation and as, as the global body of Christ need to learn and unlearn as we begin to follow Jesus. And that doesn't disqualify you or me. The fact that we once had different ideas doesn't disqualify us. In fact, what it does is it validates the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus inside of us. And so my invitation for you today is that if you have never been a part of the kingdom of God, you've never made that decision, maybe it's because somebody told you that you were out, (laughs) that you were excluded for some reason. My invitation for you today is, is, is to come in, is to be welcomed into this kingdom, to realize that because of what Christ has done, there's nothing else you need to do but trust him, that you belong, that you're a part of this. And so I'm praying that if you've never made that decision, that today would be the day that you say, yeah, I'm I'm a part of this kingdom. I'm in this. I don't get all of it. I don't understand all of it. I don't even look like any of it. But but I believe that because of Jesus, we can be in the presence of God. Now, for others of us, we might have been journeying with Jesus for a long time, but we realize that there are places in our heart and our mind and our lives where we've resurrected these walls rather than seeing life resurrected. And my prayer is that we would begin to think about those things, that we would begin to confront those places of exclusion, and that God would work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit to dismantle those pieces, that guided by the Holy Spirit, we might move forward in this kingdom of radical inclusion. We pray with me? Father God, we are so grateful that we get to be included because the reality is, is it's not that those people over there are the vomit. It's, it's, that, it's that we're the vomit. <laughs> All of us are the thing that taints your present, but it's because of Jesus that we're transformed in your presence. And so, Father God, we ask that you would begin to um, uh, bring us to life in those places where we feel like we've been excluded. And Father, would you reveal to us the places where we've excluded others? We desire to follow after you. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to convict us and empower us to mend those wrongs so we might be a unified body, so that we as a church might speak truth to powers, to see those marginalized, those rejected, the outcast be raised to life. In your name we pray. Amen.